Hello, this is Shan Chandrasekhar welcoming you to another delightful part of our program. As part of the Achievers, we featured some of the finest, highly accomplished people from around the world. Today, we are very honored to present an outstanding Canadian who has done a great job as being the group head and the chief financial officer of one of the largest banking institutions in this country, or one of the largest in North America, I should say, none other than Scotiabank. We'd like to welcome Mr. Raj Viswanathan. What a pleasure. Welcome, Raj. Thank you so much, Sean. It's a privilege to be here, and thank you for inviting me to be part of this series. First of all, I want to start off with a congratulatory note on 21 whopping awards for your global asset management. Tell us about this. No, wealth management has been a fantastic growth story for this company. We've invested a lot. We bought a lot of companies, you know, in the last five years. Very proud of the franchise itself. The awards, like you mentioned, are, you know, it's, it's almost a record from what I know. We have never won so many awards. It shows the quality of people we have in Scotiabank. Wealth management is very, very close to a lot of people's heart, right? Wow. People work very hard to, you know, earn their money and we want to help them grow their wealth. Right. Global wealth management is an integral part of the bank. It's going to be the growth area of the bank for a very long period of time. And we want to help just average Canadians at minimum. Obviously, there are a lot of wealthy Canadians as well. And we provide a lot of advice and service through our wealth management folks. Very proud of that business. You know, you're in charge of the entire finance section of the bank, the economy, taxation. So tell me about the scope of, you know, of your function. Yeah, it is quite broad, as you quite point out. The core is the finance function. So we have finance functions by business line. So we yeah. have four business lines. And then we have the corporate entity. And then we have treasury. Treasury is what we call the circulatory system of the yeah. bank. Yeah. You know, we bring in a lot of money, send out a lot of money. How do you manage the cash flow of the bank? Like you would do for your own business. You have inflows and outflows. The bank has the same thing. So we always have excess, which we expect to have for liquidity and so on. So we keep the bank safe. Yeah. We get to invest a lot. So that team is part of my larger team as well. Economics, like you point out, you know, we do have an economist who does talk about, you know, where the Canadian economy is going. And, you know, he advises a lot of clients and there's a team below that. And then we do strategic acquisitions, so we yeah. call strategic transactions investment committee, which we kind of run. And that's all about what the bank buys, what the bank sells over there. So exceptionally talented M&A people. And then we deal with investor relations as well, where we have, you know, tens of uh, thousands of investors. We have 1.2 billion shares outstanding. Wow. We have to keep in touch with our investors. They want to talk to us. They want to see what the bank is doing. And th this team, again, is a very specialized team, very powerful team. The bank is a very cohesive unit. You know, we do have responsibilities which define what we're accountable for on a daily basis. It is quite broad. My biggest advantage, Shan, is I have exceptional people who lead all these teams. They just make me look good, right? I can talk about things and look good, but these, these are the people who actually make it happen every day. Very privileged to be part of this team over here in, in Scotiabank. And certainly it keeps me active wow. every day, right? Wow. So it's fun. I want to go back to India, where <laughs> there was a little boy, Raj, <laughs> who was growing up, just going to school in those days. You and your brother, uh, I've heard some very interesting stories. Uh, and your father uh, was a, a well-recognized professional in the, with the government. Yep. And uh, you grew up you know, in West Mambalam in the early days. So tell me about those days. Did you ever think when you were in grade five or six or seven, that you're gonna hold such an important position as the group head and the chief financial officer of one of the largest banks in this country? The short answer to that is no, right? <laughs> I think when you grow up in a household, like you mentioned my brother, I can say it without any hesitation, Shan, with all due respect to everybody else I've known and worked with, he's right. the smartest man I know uh -huh. in my whole life and mm -hmm. continues to be that. He lives in Houston, he's a chemical engineer, gold medalist, Wow. out of university and so on. So when you grow up in a household like that, my dad's, you know, exceptionally good agricultural engineer, worked for the government. Wow. And one of the things that I was taught is money and integrity need not go together. But you cannot give up on integrity. Absolutely. We grew up humble, yeah. like, you know, from an economic perspective, one-room apartments and stuff like that. 
but they ensured that we had the best possible education for my brother and I. They invested, as mm -hmm. far as they are concerned, to their own detriment. Yeah. I know you're big in the film industry and entertainment. I can tell you over 25 years, they couldn't afford to go for a movie. Mm -hmm. And to them, that is fine, mm -hmm. because it was important to use the 10 rupees or 15 rupees to pay mm -hmm. the fees. Mm -hmm. So it paid off from their perspective. Um, being from that family gives you naturally the view that there is always somebody smarter than you. Mm. So it's easy because you, it's in your own family. Brilliant. I had an aunt, my mother's sister, doctorate in mathematics, uh -huh. traveled the world on one leg because she had polio. Oh, wow. And she, she passed away a couple of years back. Again, unbelievably smart. And in a very typical Indian way, even if you scored 95, the question they'd ask you is what happened to the other five, right? <laughs> there was no sensitivity around, oh my God, this kid did well. So it hurt then, as yeah. in, you know, it was difficult because you're always trying to be better than everybody else. Yeah. And um, what helped me, Shan, I'll tell you is, once I got past grade nine and 10, you know, I'm terrible at science, you know, thank God it stops in grade 10 in India. And then I found my sweet spot, mm. which is a lot about accounting, commerce, economics. So we all have certain skill sets. Yeah. When, when you get to that spot, you start realizing I can be the best I can be. Mm -hmm. So that's where I would probably say the transition started to saying, yes, I do have some skill sets, eventually. And then it becomes easier to go to school and you know, do well in exams and so on. So that's how childhood was. The one thing about our childhood was exceptionally close-knit family mm -hmm. in, in many respects. My mom is a homemaker, but I ensured we always got the best that we, they mm -hmm. could give us. Mm -hmm. There was nothing that we would go back and say we wanted to change, mm -hmm. other than the fact that it made us better in our lives. Wonderful. And that to me is, you know, I'm now in my 50s, and my parents are still with me, or they're visiting me right now over here. It's wonderful. It is truly a privilege to be given what we were given. You know, I heard from a common friend of ours that you had a very interesting incident as a schoolboy. You had your backpack <laughs> and you were trying to climb a bus and your brother made it, but you were about to get in and the bus moved and you actually fell on your back. Tell me about that particular incident. No, it's very true. They put us in one of the best schools in Chennai at that time, my parents. But it was about a half an hour bus ride from where we lived. Uh -huh. And so we lived in a place called Tinagar. The school was in Adyar. You have to take the public transport. It's called Palawan Transport over there. Yeah. Very nice buses, nothing to do. But you talked about a little boy. I really was little, right? And although I was in grade four at that time, yeah. even for my, for my age, I was little. And I had a growth spurt much later. So, uh, yeah, like you said, my brother got into the bus and I had to get into the bus behind him. And obviously the driver didn't see me because I was too small. And yeah. they moved the bus. Yeah. And I fell, like oh. you pointed out. And people tell me that the only reason I survived was because of the school bag. You know, India is great. You carry so many books, right, over there, whether it's for every, t every subject as well as workbooks and so on. And that saved me. So I think education saved me in more ways than one, right? It actually physically saved me from getting hurt. And back to my parents. So they decided immediately, this is too risky. So we moved to a one-room apartment, one street away from... St. Michael's Academy in, uh, in Gandhinagar, only to ensure that we could actually walk to school. Wow. So you take away the risk, yeah. which they thought was unacceptable, because anything could have happened that day. So it's an incident that, um, you know, there, there are many things that define life, yeah. and this would be one of those very early in life. Although I recall a lot of it, I'm sure my parents recall more of the details than I do. You went to Vivekananda College. Yes. Uh, we're a very prestigious institution, part totally. of Madras University. Totally. Tell us about that. No, I joined Vivekananda College right after high school, so 1980 to 83. I started there in uh, Bachelor of Commerce. Yeah. As I mentioned, you know, accounting economics was good after I moved over from Santom High School, which is where yeah. I did my grade 11 and 12. An unbelievably good institution. Mm -hmm. That's the only way to describe it. Mm -hmm. It is something that is, you know, revered even till today. Mm -hmm. The particular college professors were great. You know, they were tough. They wanted you to learn. So it can be difficult, but when you look back, you say, we needed that, mm -hmm. right, it completely. So I spent one year, and those days they allow you to write the CA entrance exam, wow. you know, in tandem with your undergrad, so this would have been 1984. Mm -hmm. So I wrote the entrance exam, and you need to score more than 60% mm -hmm. in the CA entrance exam, and they'll let you do the dual program. So you save a couple of years. Right. 
So I moved over and, uh, to the evening college in Vivekananda at that time so that I could work with the, with the accounting firm as part of my CA program during the day. The days were long. You know, you start at 8.30, 9 o'clock, you got to go into work and then get to school around 5.30 in the evening and the college goes all the way till about 9.30. Mm -hmm. So it makes for a long day. Again, back in hindsight, when you look back, easy because you got a lot of the education done early. You learn a lot when you actually work mm -hmm. along with the learning. Uh -huh. So the learning makes sense because mm -hmm. you're applying it, like doing co-op programs like we do here in Canada. It was not a co-op program. It was a full-time program over there. So I had to work you know, throughout the day and five days a week and so on. Very, very challenging time, uh -huh. but very rewarding when Wonderful. I look back. Wonderful. You know, what would you say is the difference in your undergraduate education uh, in India as compared to undergraduate education in Canada or post-secondary education? No, I, I think it's a very good question because I have one son. He, he went through the entire education system. He's born in Canada and so on. Right. Through high school or through middle school as well as um, uh, through undergrad university, he's a lawyer now. You know, constantly I can compare and contrast. A little less when he got into university because he stayed on his own in, in Western, which is where he went to school in London, was the school was so much fun in Canada, uh -huh. right? And I remember reading some of his textbooks. I was trying to help him in earlier years, even if it was physics, right? Uh -huh. I told you how bad I was in science. Oh, it actually made more sense to me, uh -huh. what I was reading, because mm -hmm. it felt like they were trying to depict real life uh -huh. to what they're trying to teach you in the mm -hmm. textbooks. Uh -huh. And school itself is, I think, a little more relaxed, obviously. You know, there are people who can debate is it right or wrong between India and Canada, but it's not like every three months you have a test. Uh -huh. You don't have an annual exam. You don't have a public exam where you get marked against everybody else. Right. So as long as you do well in school, you feel constantly encouraged. And, you know, your, your own teacher is always paying attention to you and helping you out in Canada. Yeah. So I think there is something which is good when yeah. you're a younger person in Canada. Yeah. It boosts your confidence along the way. You need to be more resilient to get through the Indian school system. The times I was in, I have no idea how it is in India anymore. But in times when I was there, to compare to what happens in Canada today, I do see the difference. I'm not sure which one is better or not. I don't have a firm opinion. But I can see the advantages each one has. You know, you didn't come straight from India to Canada, but you had some experience already outside of India in Bahrain. Right. Tell me about your stay in Bahrain and what took you to Bahrain. Yeah, uh, I think, you know, I was, to, to be honest, Jan, I was not looking to leave India at all. I see. My brother had already moved to the United States yeah. uh, to work with Halliburton at that time in the oil industry. And I said, I'm fine in India. I work for a really good uh, private corporation over there. They treated me very well. There's no reason to do it. I did have a supervisor, a boss, as, as I called him, and he's still a friend of mine. He's since retired and so on, who said, you should go out. And he had worked in the Middle East for some time. So he sent me an ad from the Times of India saying, you should apply for this company. Mm -hmm. And the company was called KPMG. Uh -huh. <laughs> I didn't know anything about KPMG because they did not operate in India those uh -huh. days. But obviously, they're a big four firm in the whole world. And for whatever reason, what they saw in me, I have no idea. We interviewed in India. I think, I think they'd interviewed a lot of people. And they decided I should be one among six people they wanted to hire or into Bahrain. Wow. Mm. So fantastic opportunity. Because I got to learn to work in a very professional environment. I had done my CA in India in a very small firm. KPMG is huge. Mm -hmm. So you learn a lot about how do you actually run an audit mm -hmm. and why do you do it? A mm -hmm. lot of training, so it helped. A lot of good people there. Bahrain is a small country. When we lived there, it was less than half a million people. So kind of everybody knows everybody, right? Mm -hmm. If you go around, it's not difficult to run into people multiple mm -hmm. times in a mm -hmm. day. And there's a lot of expatriate population from India and other mm -hmm. parts of Asia. Mm -hmm. Very nice people, even the local people. Very mm -hmm. friendly, very happy people. And people who actually wanted to get themselves educated and you know, work and do better and so uh -huh. on. So a lot of things you learn outside of work about culture in those institutions, in those countries, when you're there. So three years I worked for KPMG and then I joined British Bank of the Middle East, which is HSBC, mm -hmm. over there where they hired me in Dubai. Mm -hmm. So between the two places, we spent about a little short of five years. Wow. Four years and ten months or so, mm -hmm. yeah. Exceptionally but good experience. There's another interesting side of you which I discovered that you were quite a cricketer, you know, because of the <laughs> fact you were a batsman and you actually even played in, in, in the big stadium in Sharjah. 
Yeah, so that, tell me a little bit about your interest in, in, in sports, especially in cricket. I think so. I'm still a big fan of sports because I just like sports over there. My, my brother, again, was an exceptionally sp good sportsman. Uh -huh. Like he's got Sportsman of the Year Award and stuff like that, right? Mm -hmm. He's really good. And uh, so I played a lot of cricket growing up in India to the extent my parents actually got worried, <laughs> saying, this kid's not going to make it, right? Through school <laughs> and so on, because somehow I found a way to go play cricket and so on, which is till today the biggest yeah. sport in India. Yeah. Fun. Again, team sports teaches you a lot. Sure. And there was a good league system in Chennai where I grew up over there, where I really enjoyed playing. And um, I stopped playing or I left India, you know, and pretty much stopped playing in 1987-88. And I moved to Bahrain and um, eventually when I moved to Dubai, it's actually a very funny incident, but a very, um, very memorable one. It's a way to say it. Uh, the bank had a team. I was, play I was working for HSBC and they wanted me to play for them, but it was long since I'd stopped playing and you know, you, you change interests and so on and become physically a bit lazy to this truth to it. But one day they wanted me to play a specific that game. That I find it hard to believe. Because <laughs> I can never imagine you being even slightly lazy. Oh, okay. I think so. I think yeah. you should ask my parents or maybe ask my wife, she'll tell you that, <laughs> right? Is, um, so they had only 10 players and cricket, as you know, you need 11. And they said, can you please just, just play this one game? because otherwise we'd forfeit the, you know, the tournament for them, right? And they cannot forfeit. That sure, I'll play. But I didn't realize it was a day-night game in the Sharjah Stadium mm -hmm. that we were playing. Uh -huh. So it's great, you know, great experience. It's the last time I played like an organized game. Since then, this would have been in 1997, I think. Mm -hmm. And I didn't do much in the game, so I wouldn't talk about what else I did not contribute to the team over there, but it's a great experience. Day night is something which is a little more common now than it was in the 90s. So, you know, it's a great experience. Of course, playing in Sharjah Stadium where, you know, everybody has watched India games and, you know, the Sharjah Cup and so on. And it was, it was very memorable. Bahrain's loss was Canada's gain. I'm glad. Uh, <laughs> but what motivated you to choose Canada when your brother was already well settled in the United States? A lot of people would have preferred a more affluent country, uh, United States, than Canada in those days. You were highly qualified. But it's wonderful that I'm delighted that you chose Canada. What was it that you, motivated you towards Canada? We're also very delighted with how, you know, the last 27 years has turned out for us in Canada. My son was born here, right. you know, a uh, few months after we got here. Um, it actually is a very simple story, Shan. We both had no idea why we wanted to come to Canada. That's mm -hmm. the truth, uh -huh. okay? My wife worked for a company there and she had a colleague who was from Canada. Uh -huh. And so, you know, they became friends of ours and we started talking, saying, okay, what do we do now, right? Mm -hmm. Because we're going to probably start a family and so on. And India had started getting better too, you know, in the 1990s when, when the economy opened up and India seemed attractive. So we said, let's think about where do we want to go, uh -huh. you know, from here. Uh -huh. And so not much thought other than this couple told us you should go to Canada. Canada is a beautiful country and everything else. Uh -huh. said, okay, let's go to Canada. Mm -hmm. So we put in an application, didn't think much about it. This would have been in 1997, uh -huh. and uh, it would have been, I don't know, February or March, we put in an application, and we had no idea. We got our, what we call IMM papers in three yep. months. Yep. Mm. And frankly, the two of us sat down and said, okay, so what do we do now, right? <laughs> and we said, okay, let's go. By then we realized, you know, we're gonna have our son born, and then, you know, you have all these restrictions about traveling and so on. So we said, okay, let's get on a plane. Mm -hmm. Let's get to Toronto see how, what life does to us. Mm -hmm. HSBC or BBME where I was working there, they said, can you stay for the year end? Mm -hmm. I said, okay, you know, it's not like some, I have a job here. So we landed in Toronto on November 7th, 1997. Wow. Never seen snow in my life, never <laughs> seen temperatures below 25 degrees probably ever in my life. Yeah. So no real thought behind it. That's yeah. the truth. Yeah. But I can tell you something, Shan, it's the best plan that we never made and the way it worked out. Wonderful. And that's a lot of tribute to a lot of people who have helped me along the way. And it's a lot of tribute to what Canada offers to many, many people. I'm not the exception in my opinion. Tell me about your early experience, you know, following your arrival in Canada. What was it like here in the first <laughs> two to three years? Yeah, so I went back, finished the year, and like I said, I came back here 98 January. Yeah. 1998 January. Meanwhile, KPMG offered me a job because uh -huh. I met with them and I was here for a couple of weeks. So very, very fortunate and very grateful to KPMG to do what they did for me. Right. So I came back with a job. So most immigrants that I know of 
to you know have difficulty in the early years uh, before they early months I should say not years before they establish themselves. Right. I had the privilege of not going through that. Right. However, Sean, I think you know I went through my own challenges in my own mind. Yeah. Because you're always comparing. What did I give up to? What do I have here? Why am I yeah. doing it? I told yeah. you we didn't really make plans. Yeah. So I would say about six months was difficult in many respects. It's cold, mm. right? It's very yeah. difficult to get around. I've yeah. never lived in small apartments because we live. And you start realizing long commutes. We've always lived in Oakville and I worked in Toronto. So you're talking about taking the GO train mm. and it's cold, mm. right? right? To, to walk around, it's very difficult to go through that. So for all the goodness that was going around in my life, my son was born, we had landed very well, I had a job. Human nature teaches you to look at the downside. Mm. What do I not have? Interesting. And I did that. Mm. To some extent, you know, I can give 100% credit to my wife. She said, because she loved it from day one here. Mm. There's no doubt. Mm. Okay. So I looked at her and said, she said, why don't you go do your American CPA? Mm. And in reality, that was the distraction in her mind saying, get this guy off thinking always about the negative side. Uh -huh. over it. So I did that, uh -huh. which was in uh, December 98. So I wrote the CPA exam from Denver and I did very well. Wow. You know, I ranked in the U.S. And, uh, and in the state that I wrote in Colorado and so on. I'm not surprised. You know, so. I was. I can <laughs> tell you that. Is, but what that does is changes the mindset. Uh -huh. KPMG was a great organization to work mm. for. Now you think, hey, I'm not bad as an uh -huh. accountant, right? Even in the most uh, economically advanced country of the world, the United States, as we mm. talked about, which is our neighboring country too. Yeah. So this is good. And we can make things work. Mm. And then KPMG gave me a promotion, so suddenly you feel good at work too. And eventually you feel like those days, 12 months back, was forgotten. Mm. But when I recall now, it was difficult. So I can imagine a lot of our new immigrants going through it, and we've tried, the two of us, to help as many people as we can. Mm. Either to just know that there is a family that is happy to help, and in some people we've helped them you know, get employment and so on, get on their feet. That's wonderful. Which to us is very satisfying because we have not forgotten what we went through and some of the people who helped us. KPMG didn't, you know, call me in and say, we'd like to hire you. There is a person, Mervyn Ramos, who just retired as a Deloitte partner. We didn't know. Uh -huh. He just chose to help us because there's only this one family we knew coming into Canada. Mm -hmm. And they helped me meet the right people in KPMG and I had a job. Mm -hmm. So that to me is payback time wonderful. to me and it'll be payback time till I can do it. Tell me a little bit about your family now. They, they say behind every successful man there is a very successful woman. So tell me about your wife and your son. Totally. I'll start with the funny thing. Um, we, we have a sign at home which says behind every successful man there's a woman rolling her eyes. Okay? <laughs> I think there's a lot of truth to it over here. But jokes apart, yeah. I think, you know, I'm very blessed, Shen. Very, very blessed. I've had a, a life partner now for almost coming up on, you know, 30 years, 27 wonderful. years and a bit. Wonderful, wonderful. She's been exceptionally nice. She compliments me, like I talked to you about the, the experience of asking me to do the CPA and so on. She also knows how to distract me in the right way <laughs> to ensure that, you know, I don't, I don't waver around over there. Yeah. And that's a blessing. You know, we got to know each other before we got married and so on. But through life, that's what we have learned of each other. We compliment each other. We try to be good. Wonderful. Nobody believes me, I actually don't talk much. I really do not. Okay? And we wouldn't have friends if not for her. Mm. She's a social person. She likes to interact with people, help a lot of people and so on. Wonderful. Charity, all that stuff. So I learn a lot every day. Wonderful. Just living with somebody who has those kind of values. My son is one of the smartest people I know as well. Wonderful. He's a really good kid. And like the two of us talk, you know, all we did was give him opportunities, really. Everything else, whatever he has done, is him. Mm. There's no lawyer in the family. I don't know how he wanted to become a lawyer. And he's done well so far, right? Mm. He still has a long way to go. Yeah. The start is good. Yeah. So he's done very well. He's played a lot of sport himself. He's a good kid. And he surrounded himself, the social circle that we have, you know, our friends, children, and so on. Really, really good. They all get along very well. They're all very good in what they do. Some are wealth management. Some are in accounting. You know, some are in banking, for example, he's in a law firm. But when they get together, you can see they are like family because mm -hmm. none of us are family. Friends are our family. Yeah. So that part of it is also being, you know, exceptionally well done now. Yeah. 
And now I'm fortunate that my parents hopefully will stay with me. Now, you know, they've come on the super visa, as they call it, in Canada. Wonderful. Because we don't have immigration open. So we're hoping to now be back as a family for the longest possible time. So couldn't say enough nice things about how life has treated us. Now, we see you as a tremendous role model in, in our community. What would you advise, especially with the uh, education that you pursued, both in India and in Canada and in the United States, what would be your advice to young people with respect to the importance of education? 100% Shan. I think education is my story, right? Somebody invested my parents in yeah, you know, helping us get what we need. Of course, you need to make the effort so that it pays off over there and so on. Education to me is fundamental. I remember the story when you know, we have the RESP programs. Right. So my son was born in the hospital, so they came and asked, can you do it? Right. And of course, they needed to do disclosures. And one of it they said was, oh, but if he didn't go to university, you know, the government will take back the 20%. Uh, that they contribute to to match what you do. And I remember telling this individual who was talking to us about it is, if I'm alive, he will go to university. There's no option over here. It's a very biased view. Not everybody needs to agree with me. It doesn't matter to me. To me, education is not just about the qualification you get. Education teaches you a lot. Good, bad, you learn the things that you don't like. You learn the things that is going to help you for the rest of your life. doesn't matter where you get educated. I was educated in India, right? And, and not here, the only thing I've done is a US CPA uh, to show that I have a, a North American qualification. Education gives you a foundation to learn. After that, we all start working, we try to become the best we have, uh, sorry, that we can become in the employees we do. To me, that is foundational. When we go to college, when we go to university, when we go to postgrad, whatever we want to do, it's not just about satisfying somebody's need or satisfying your own need of um, you know, having letters behind your name. It's about what you learn, how you can apply it. But most importantly, it gives you an identity. Mm -hmm. When I passed the Indian CA, this was, you know, it's tough to pass in India, as most people know, in 1988. It was a feeling of relief, I can tell you. The excitement mm -hmm. came later on, because mm -hmm. just passing is a big deal. But it gives you an identity that you're an accountant now. Mm -hmm. It was very important in my own family, because I, I'm around smart people. Mm -hmm. So I felt like, okay, I'm good too, right, mm -hmm. over there. So it does a lot beyond just you know, initials and what we do. Eventually, education is the ticket to success, in my view. The exceptions are always there. Everybody will talk about the exception of Bill Gates not going to university or dropped out of Harvard and all that. That's why you talk about them, because they are the exception. Mm. We are the norm. We are the average. Mm -hmm. Most of us are the average. What do you do after that with the education is up to individuals. Back to who you work for, what's the opportunities you think are important and how you build your career. Mm -hmm. Career building to me is like, I watch a lot of baseball. Mm -hmm. It's like baseball. Mm -hmm. It's a long game. It is a slow game. Baseball is, right? People who like hockey will know the, the contrary and view on baseball. But baseball is one of those games where it teaches you that life is long mm -hmm. in your career. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of you know, commonality in my mind. I can keep talking about baseball for the next half an hour. That's not the point. But careers are long. If you succeed when you're 25, doesn't mean you'll be successful when you're 50. Mm. That's the point. So if you have patience and you continue to be better after you've acquired all the education that is important, mm -hmm. integrity is very important, my personal view. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter what you do in any organization mm -hmm. because you get associated with the wrong people, life is too short. We have a large audience from the Caribbean who are our viewers. Uh, they are from Trinidad, Guyana, Suriname, uh, and other parts of West Indies. Now, uh, you've traveled to many parts of the world, and yes. Scotiabank is very strong in the Caribbean. Yeah. I've noticed it even I used to travel. Now, you recently went to Guyana, and you actually met the president of Guyana. So tell us a little bit about your trip. No, there. that was completely unplanned. Uh -huh. And, you know, I had to go to Guyana to meet the central bankers and so on as we were trying to reshape the bank strategy in that country. Uh -huh. So I said I have to do it in person. Back to you need to respect people, right? Small country, 800 and odd thousand people, but important country. Scotia Bank operates there, so the regulator is important, doesn't matter. Right. They were kind enough, so my morning meeting was the Minister of Finance. I've never met a Minister of Finance in my life till then. Very cordial. And they talk about why Guyana should be important to Scotia Bank. Uh -huh. It's about saying, hey, it's a good country over here, and we love that you're here, and so on. And by the time 
lunch rolled around and I was supposed to meet one of our corporate clients say for lunch, I got a message saying the president wants to meet you. I said, the president of the country? Okay, sure, right? I didn't know what to expect. But one thing I learned in that one day, so it was a half an hour meeting, very cordial, you know, all the security and all you go through, you feel very important over there, but you don't realize he's the one who's important, not me. And um, really good conversation. These people are all doctorates there, mm. Shan. Back to my earlier comment about education. Mm -hmm. They are real doctorates. They've gone to school, they've done their PhD, they submitted their theses, defended it, whatever you need to do to become a doctorate. Respect. Because mm. it's out of knowledge that they become. Yeah, they're politicians, they're presidents sure. and so on. Young man, sure. he just had his second baby, so congratulated oh. him and so on. But you can see visionary. Mm. You know, in his own world, mm -hmm. as in Guyana is important to him. Talked a lot about it and so on. So very privileged. Mm -hmm. Happened pretty much in two hours notice. We did that. To me, Guyana or any other country in the Caribbean is, the bank has been there. Like in Guyana, we've been there since 1966, mm -hmm. almost as old as I. Mm -hmm. Most of the Caribbean, we've been there for close to 100 years. Mm -hmm. I was in the Bahamas last week. We do our operations there, and I sit on a couple of the boards, go there. They love Scotiabank. Mm. So to us, we're in a business of trust. Yeah. When our customers trust us, uh, they like us, half the battle is won. Mm. Then we just need to ensure we deliver on the trust every day. In the Caribbean, not me, the bank has built it over 100 years. Wow. And that trust is what we want to keep going. Caribbean is a very important area uh, for the bank's operations. Mm -hmm. Very, very um, deposit rich, which is very important for a bank, but most importantly, very loyal customers. Mm -hmm. So we hope to do more in the Caribbean. We want to be more successful in the Caribbean, mm -hmm. but it's up to you. You know, you're an extraordinarily knowledgeable professional in the field of finance. You know, you're a wizard. Uh, and you are a thorough gentleman, you've got the highest integrity. Has you have never been approached by anybody in terms of entering politics at all? <laughs> uh, no, I think it's a short answer. Uh, one of my previous vice chair of the bank, Sabi Marwa or Sarabjit Singh Marwa, is still a good friend of mine, right. a huge mentor, one of the finest people I've met and obviously very, very knowledgeable. So he did become a senator, I yes. think he... Yes. He, he recently retired as a senator and he said, I'm the only guy who's retired twice in my lifetime. <laughs> when I met with him, no. I think um, I'm fascinated by politics because I watch and it's integral to the business we do, yeah. right? You're an extraordinary achiever and we are very honored to have you in the program. You are a great role model and amidst your extremely busy schedule, I'm very happy that you found the time to come down and visit us. We'd love to have you back very, very soon. It is a privilege, Shan. Thank you so much for asking me to be part of this. And I don't mean that flippantly at all. Raj, this is the first time you're visiting our studio. I think there's only one thing, one word I can describe it. It's amazing. I didn't know. I didn't know the span of ATN, didn't know a bit of the history that I'm very thankful that you took the time to walk us through. I can see the passion that you have to what you've been doing for, like you said, 40 plus years. I know about ATN and so on. You know, we all watch television and so on. But what goes behind it? is apart from all the technology, the people and all that, sure, you know, the space that you have, which I think is fantastic, uh, is the passion behind people who want to do this. The passion that you still have after 40 years, I think is, um, you know, not comparable to many people. Thank you. We all do get burnt out over a period of time. You don't have that. <laughs> I can see the same energy. I can only imagine how much more you had 40 years back. And, and that to us is something that we look up to because you know, life is long. We all do what we do very well. You know, you talked about how I do, you know, banking and so on. It comes naturally to me. I think, yeah, I mean, there's another 90,000 people who do it. But people who are in the creative arts, I have a lot of respect for, whether they're musician, musicians. You know, anybody who's a musician, I think, is exceptionally blessed. And when I look at the number of people who have been through the studio, you know, as you walk me through it, like I told you, I actually feel exceptionally privileged to be asked to come in over here to talk to you as well as be part of this program. You know, people like Lata Mangeshkar, you know, you said she visited nine times. That's, you know, she's one of the best we have produced out of India. I think everybody will agree. Apart from right up to Anirudh, you were talking to me. I did not know he was related to you and so on. So I can see it. It's in your blood. It's in the passion that your family has had throughout. And what you have built here... I actually didn't know what to expect. Because when we came in, it looks like a very simple building. But when you walk through, 
I have no idea how these things work. I'm a little more knowledgeable after one hour spending with you, so thank you for doing that for me. It was such a pleasure meeting you and, your, um, and Mrs. Vishwanathan as well. So again, we wish you all the best, and my best wishes to your colleagues there as well. And keep up the extraordinary work that you're doing. Uh, without exaggerating, I'm telling you, you're extraordinary. You're a fund of knowledge, but you're a personification of humility. Again, best wishes. Thank you so much, Sean. All the best. Much appreciated.